from The Advocate magazine in partnership with GLAAD. I'm Jeffrey Masters, and today I'm talking to Jameson Green. He is an author and the past president of the World Professional Association for Transgender Health. He has spent the large part of his career writing about transgender health policy, and that work has been used to lay the groundwork for anti-discrimination practices at insurance companies and in other healthcare settings. The scope and scale of his work is really hard to overstate. And also worth noting, he's trans. That's important to say because on the whole, we hear relatively little from trans men. And maybe that's the wrong way to phrase it, right? It's not that we don't hear from trans men, it's that we don't let them speak. We don't platform them in the way we do trans women. So today we talk about that, about why trans men are seemingly so invisible in our community. We talk about why gender nonconformity makes people feel like they're being threatened. And we also talk about his book, which blew me away, that is called Becoming a Visible Man. So without further ado, this is LGBTQ and a with Jameson Green. So I'm really interested in and want to talk about the community of trans men that you were part of in the 80s. This was in San Francisco. But before we talk about that, what was your first exposure to transness and specifically to trans men? I saw Steve Dane on television. Steve Dane was the most famous trans man in the world until Rene Richards transitioned, which happened the day after his story made it to the front page of the New York Times. So his story makes it to the front page, then Rene Richards comes out and you never hear about Steve Dane again, because people don't care about trans men, especially in New York, when Rene Richards is well-known socialite, ophthalmologist, tennis player, you know, very exciting person for New Yorkers. And Steve Dane is a high school gym teacher in Emeryville, California. But Steve Dane was an extremely impressive individual, and he transitioned in 1976. When I saw him on television, it was like, that's the person I need to talk to. That's the person who will know how to explain this to me. I called myself cross-gendered. I felt as though there were wires crossed between my brain and my body. I didn't have any language. And I hadn't known anybody else who felt the way I did. I, I think that we think about famous trans people through history. And you hear the name Christine Jorgensen. And then you think there was not a single trans person until like Laverne Cox again. Right. I mean, obviously, that's not true. We know that. But it seems like the reality is that there is and has always been trans people in the media. But we have just like forgotten them really quickly. That's right. Yes. And particularly trans men. I mean, back in the 70s also, there were two other very active trans men active in trying to do education using the media as much as they had access to it. They were Jude Patton and Jason Cromwell. But are they remembered? No. Jude Patton is 81 years old. Jason Cromwell's younger than I am, I think. I mean, I think that someone who you knew personally, Lou Sullivan, yes. is somebody who has also been forgotten to history. Unfortunately, Lou's group, Lou Sullivan's group, FTM, was focused on trans men because trans men had no information and trans men were not covered in the media. Trans men were not even really referred to in the standards of care such as they existed at the time. It was like trans men didn't exist. And Lou Sullivan published the FTM newsletter, which was one of the first newsletters of its kind. This was in the 80s, and eventually you did take it over. But one of the things that Lou Sullivan is remembered for today is for being both trans and gay, which for the time it stood out in a way that sounds rather crazy to our modern ears. Yeah, he identified as gay, and the medical establishment said, if you are gay identified, you cannot transition. We're not in the business of making queers. And he pointed out, and this was something that some psychologists were aware of, but it wasn't really a conscious, you know, how, how do we apply this in the real world? But sexual orientation and gender identity are two different things. And he promoted that in a really big way with medical 
providers to make them aware that just because one has a sexual orientation that is homosexual, that doesn't mean one cannot transition. And I mean, speaking now, I think the audience hears that and is like, yeah, of course. That's right. That's because he promoted, he started promoting it and many other people picked it up. And so the other like conception of trans masculinity back then, and correct me if I'm wrong, was that this was a solitary experience that you were supposed to go off and do alone. Yes, you should do it alone and you should never hang out with other trans people because then people might think you're stra- you were trans. The idea of transition was to become normal. Trans people were told, you have to change your occupation, move to a different city, destroy all your photographs of, of your family growing up. You didn't have that childhood that you ex- actually experienced. You have to make up a story about your childhood so that people will accept you as a full human being once you transition so you can be normal. And to my mind, that was not normal. And and so I think that is like a big question that I had reading your book was like, when did you break out of that way of thinking? since you kind of like never bought into that? I don't know, but I think part of it may be because I spent most of my life prior to my transition being visibly non-binary. People did not know what sex I was. People could not tell. And so I didn't think there was anything wrong with me. I was just different. And so I wasn't about to be told that I didn't belong, that I couldn't have a job, that I couldn't be something in the world. I wasn't going to accept that just because people couldn't tell what sex I was. You also wrote that like, like as you matured physically growing up, like the difference between your body and your gender created problems for you and nearly everyone around you. I think that we think of gender as such an individual experience that we don't think about it creating problems for other people. It's a social communication, gender. It's a language. It's a language that we use to tell something about ourselves, and to perceive other people without knowing certain things about them. We use gender as how we perceive people, as well as how people communicate. It's a two-way street. And so what is it about gender nonconformity, any sort of gender transgression, that makes somebody feel like they're being threatened? They feel that they can't understand what's going on. They don't have control of the situation because they don't have the information they need they don't know how to treat you. And so they assume, and they and if they've been if they have an association with any kind of variance like that, with perversion or criminal behavior, or and this is and this is common for years, for hundreds of years, anybody who didn't quite fit a gender norm, there comes a point where you cross a line and you don't fit a gender norm. You can't be categorized, you become a threat because you upset the order of the world. It seems like that's the level of threat that's experienced by people. Gender is a power symbol too, particularly if you know whether someone's a man or a woman, you know how on guard you need to be if you're going to have to get into a fight or not, whether or not you can approach them if you happen to be attracted to them, depending on the cultural constructs within your society. And which always are in flux also. But people don't aren't aware of how in flux it is because we all have our assumptions about how the world relates to us and we relate to the world. And if we can't let go of some of that control, then that's when we start to run into social problems. That's interesting. Okay, so just to use a simple example, I might walk into a building and hold a door open for a woman, but not a man. And so if I don't have experience with gender nonconformity, I don't know how to treat this person. And I'm there at the door and my brain just kind of like short circuits. Yeah. That's interesting. Yeah. And some people find when they, they've experienced that short circuiting, it throws them completely off and they can get very angry in response. They think they're being assaulted. I think there's a neurological function going on here for a lot of people with respect to how they interpret gender. And some people's neurological pathways actually have more difficulty than others. I think there's a lot of things going on that we simply don't know about yet in science, frankly. 
We, we've talked a couple of times, or at certain points, we've gone back to like the like seeming invisibility of trans men in culture. Mm -hmm. I know there's not just one reason for that, but can you talk about what some of those reasons are or might be? Fundamentally, I think to some extent, it relies on misogyny. It's very, very interesting if someone wants to cut off their penis. Why would they do that? Oh my God. That's what often people think about a trans woman. But what do people think about girls? Well, of course, women always want to be men because men are superior. So that's just typical. Why not? And they're not a threat because they're just a woman. Whereas a guy transitioning away from the cohort of men where he has to hold up the specter of masculinity, he's failed. Now he's making fun of us. We have to ostracize him because at the same time, he may become something attractive. I also think that, or I've assumed, that trans men also have male privilege. And with men, we're just taught to respect them. And like, we're almost bored by them. We like let them go. But for women, we're taught to like gawk at them and stare at them and talk about their appearance and what they're wearing. There is something to that. And this is something I try to talk about within trans men circles and also outside of it, that trans men have an option. Trans men have not been enculturated exactly the same way and have a responsibility, in my opinion, to be conscious of that false masculinity, that false, you know, objectification of women, that you should know better. Is that something you had to learn for yourself? I think I knew it. I don't think I learned it exactly. I think I just knew it. I always knew I wasn't really a woman, even though I tried to do things sometimes that would that would be supportive of women. I was very supportive of women in the sense that I agree with the tenets of feminism, but I never really fit. Even when I was living as a lesbian, there were lots of times when my lesbian friends said, you don't want to come to this women-only event because you'll be bored. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't it amazing like what other people in our lives can like see in us before we can see it? Yeah, absolutely. I think it's important that we do talk about trans men specifically because when we don't, we don't talk about the issues that affect trans men. We talk so much about the violence against trans women necessarily. It's a huge issue. However, we don't talk about like the rates of like self-harm and suicide that do affect the trans male community and also domestic violence is something that really affects trans men. It hasn't been studied that much, but that's something that you get into trans men's circles, you'll hear about. And often the violence is perpetrated by women, by female partners. I did not know that. Gay identified trans men also can end up in a partnership with a gay man and end up in a violent situation. I mean, that just points to like these larger issues of domestic violence. I mean, the rate for women, I think it's like one out of four, one out of five. It's massive. Mm -hmm. Also, like the majority of violence against trans women specifically, it's intimate partner violence. That's right. These speak to larger cultural issues, not just anything to do with transness. But people will use transness as an excuse for violence. In terms of the trans masculine community specifically, in your book in 2004, it's been almost 20 years, but you wrote that though we've made great progress, I still don't believe we have a real community yet, but I believe we should keep invoking it, keep trying to build it because we're on our way to achieving it. So it's been 20 years. Do you still feel that way? That we're like almost there, but not there yet? Yes, I still do. And my book has been reissued in 2020 in a revised edition because it was one of Vanderbilt's best-selling books ever on their entire list. Whoa. And 2020 was their 80th anniversary year. And so they gave me an opportunity to update the text. And in the foreword, I wrote at least two generations of transgender, non-binary identified, and other gender non-conforming people have emerged since this book was first published. I see the YouTube videos, the Facebook groups, the conversations on Reddit and many other forums, the growth of community-based organizations, and the new scholarship flourishing in all the regions of the globe. And I love the energy and the commitment so many people are bringing to their self-explorations and efforts to improve the quality of life that trans people and their families experience. At the same time, 
I see that far too many people are asking the same questions that my own cohort of trans people asked 30, 40, 50 years ago, and far too many people still believe that there is no information to be found about transgender lives. I know how tempting it is in the U.S. especially to want to discard the past and forge new ground, but I'm also heartened by the recent attention to our collective history from today's students and transgender identified people who have been surprised and gratified to realize that they have not been alone all this time. We have ancestors and pioneers, and there is a context for our lives. So yes, I am still optimistic that we can form community. I think that the social media revolution that took place between the first and second editions of my book has changed things a bit. Online support groups are ubiquitous. They're also not always very well moderated. So it's a hard, it's a, we're in a difficult time. I actually have one more question about the first edition of the book. This was the one published in 2004. And the word you use the most is transsexual. Is that how you prefer to identify? Well, I, that, is my, that was my diagnosis. I didn't have gender dysphoria. The di diagnosis didn't exist. You know, gender identity disorder hadn't been invented. All those things were not there. And so there's a lot of people who do identify with the term transsexual. And there's a lot of people right now who will tell you that it's an obsolete term, it's insulting, people don't care about it. Those terms are all relative and our terminology is all over the place. I don't go around saying I'm a transsexual. It was my diagnosis. If I had cancer, I wouldn't go around saying I'm a cancer. But the term is what is used in the medical literature. And transgender is not a medical term. It's not a diagnostic term. It's a community-based term. And I've been really, really serious about, well, I was, I kind of lost the battle, about telling the medical profession that's not their term to use or appropriate. They should not be treating transgender as a condition. I think transgender health, that's what they should be focusing on is transgender health. You don't treat the condition of transgender, you advocate for transgender health because it's a transgender community. That's interesting. I've never heard anyone make that argument before. You're saying that for the trans community, appropriate healthcare, there are issues to be treated. However, the issue of being trans is not an issue and not something to be treated. Right. It's something for a trans person to manage in their own way. It's something to be aware of because it's going to affect your social relationships. Similar to all like sexualities. Yeah. Like it affects so much about your life, but it's not a condition. Right. You, you've you made transgender health policy a cornerstone of your work. Yes. When did that begin? Yes. When did you realize like, oh, that this is the focus? Well, the first thing was when I started my transition, I had just started a new job. And so I got the new the insurance documents and I saw something that I had never noticed before in any insurance plan consciously but that there was an exclusion for transsexual treatment. That was the language. All transsexual treatment would be excluded. And I thought, well, that's a bummer. It was written so broadly. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm sorry. No, I'm really. Because it was written so broadly that it meant, basically, that if I got a sore throat, I couldn't go to the doctor. If I broke my leg, I couldn't go to the doctor. It would be transsexual treatment because I was transsexual. And in fact... Many people experienced that. Many people have been thrown out of emergency rooms with, you know, lacerations and broken arms and stuff because we don't treat people like you. We can't treat you. We can't treat a trans person. So I tried to figure out how to get insurance exclusions removed and was fairly successful in that. And then I, I realized if we got exclusions removed and, and that it was okay to, for trans people to be treated in emergency, basic medical care, as well as transition-related care, then we would need more providers. So that's why I got involved with the Harry Benjamin International Gender Dysphoria Association. We needed somebody to be a champion organization. We needed somebody with some clout and authority, and they'd been producing the standards of care since 1979. So I joined that organization I was on the board 
and I was elected to another four year. It was a four year term. I was elected to another four year term in 2007. And then in 2011, I was elected president and was at a presidential term that lasted seven years. And during that time, I got them to start issuing policy statements, which I wrote. What were like the biggest goals you had with those statements? Like the biggest ones? Well, the first one was about the issue of medical necessity and insurance coverage in the United States. WPATH being a global organization, you know, something if something's just about the United States, it has to be specif- specified. These statements then go out and they are available for activists to use to leverage arguments to move things forward in their own jurisdictions, in their, their regions, and also to, to influence medical education about human rights, about the rights of trans people, about actual care. My goal was to change the world. Where are you at on that now? I've been pretty successful in a lot of ways, and we have a long way to go. Something that I have been advocating about for a long, long time is to be ready for conservative backlash and to be ready for the religious right machine that has basically orchestrated all of these laws that are coming out in these state houses. We're just very lucky that we have a federal administration that isn't buying into this, but we have a lot of battles to fight on the ground in some of these states where these legislatures have just used us as a to create a moral panic to raise funds for themselves and and basically to tie themselves into these religious groups that are trying to take over the Supreme Court. I mean, it's a tragic arc from where you were in the 70s and 80s and people couldn't define trans to now it's like being legislated against in state houses everywhere. And it's still not defined. They don't know what they're talking about. They haven't the first clue what they're talking about. They haven't the first clue what actual treatment is, just like they don't know what critical race theory is. Well, you know, I'm always looking for ways to help non-trans people understand the trans experience. And you talk about in the book about bodies, how everybody can relate to being unhappy with some part of their body. And you write about like women wanting to look, I think like Barbie was the example. You said men in the gym pumping weights like like Arnold Schwarzenegger. And you wrote, quote, Body modification is a complex phenomenon. People have done it since the beginning of time for various reasons and with various results. Changing one's sex is just one way of changing one's body. And I think that's profound and how anybody can relate to that. And I wanted to bring it up because we have done such a great job moving the public conversation about trans people away from bodies and surgeries, and for a good reason, but we've also quite possibly removed the one thing from conversation that everyone can relate to. Yeah, interesting. I don't know what to say in response to that. I really appreciate you noticing that. (laughs) I guess what I'm saying is like, how do we put the body back into the public conversation? Because no, we don't need to talk about what's in your underwear, but we can talk about other aspects of the body in respectful ways. And it might even be our strongest tool. Yes, we can and we should. It's a human thing. You know, this is what happens when you start editing education and saying, you can't talk about this and you can't talk about that. And you can't, so it means people don't, they're cut off from their own bodies and they can't learn about their own families and they can't learn about their feelings and they can't test anything about who they are. You know, like children are always trying to test boundaries, right? Yeah. You know, we have to move off gender because I also want to talk about sexuality. You came into your bisexuality in your 50s. Yeah. And I wanted to ask about it because some people report changes to their sexuality with transition, but also your sexuality is allowed to expand and evolve as you get older. Can you talk about what your experience was like? Yeah, it was. Thanks for asking about that. That It was um, interesting to me. I have read, too, that it's common, this was in an article many years ago, that 10 years after hormones, so after 10 years of cross-sex hormone experience, that people often will notice a change in their sexuality. And that's sort of what happened to me. I mean, it's, it isn't that I was never attracted to males growing up. You know, looking back on it, I, there were times when I was, but I was never actually interested enough to actually 
touch one other than in playing football or in a fight. So <laughs> didn't want to really have that sexual experience. And then I got to a point where I was comfortable enough in my own body. And I think basically having the proper hormone balance for me was part of that, that I could relate to the idea of actually being physically intimate with a man. Now, I I had had some physical intimacy experience with men, but it wasn't ever very interesting or satisfying. After 10 years of testosterone, I could recognize, ah, now I get it. I don't know how to explain it, but I was willing to experiment. And men came on to me frequently. So I always had plenty of opportunity. And I had been, I had broken up with a, a woman and I was thinking, I should get a dog <laughs> or maybe I should. <laughs> or date men. <laughs> maybe I should date men. <laughs> One or the other. Maybe I was, I kept having problems with women, you know, mostly because women have problems with men, but it was really, really good to be able to let go of fears that I had about that. And to allow myself to be intimate with a man or more than one, not at the same time. <laughs> and to be able to enjoy it. And to be able to enjoy it and to recognize that there is a difference between man on man sex and male female sex. And I know there's a difference between male female sex and woman on woman sex. It's just different. There's a different quality. Uh, different how? For me, with men, there's something just a little bit more like sport. It's like fun. And then for me, with a woman, well, there can be fun, definitely. Uh, there's also what feels like a sort of, it's a deeper kind of intimacy that comes from a vulnerability. And I think with men, that, that deeper intimacy the vulnerability is a place that doesn't come up quickly, that comes up much later in a relationship. Huh. With men, I have had very deep emotional relationships with men that are very vulnerable emotionally, and I value that tremendously. There's just more layers to get through before you get there with men. Oh, but with women, that vulnerability is more frequently there. Yeah. And for a long time, I thought what attracted me to women was the difference between them and me, that that difference was so important to that sort of excitement. And with men, I don't have that same feeling of difference. I know that to a certain extent, some guys have been very, very forthcoming with me and said, your penis is different from my penis. I don't know what to do. So help me, tell me, what should I do to make you feel good? You know, and that's great. I think that's probably an amazing question to ask. Yeah, it's very powerful. I love that you said that because I think people think like, oh my God, like what, what do I do or not do with these body parts and stress out? And the answer is ask. That's right. That's right. And I did learn that with women. I learned it with women, but I experienced it more reflexively with another man. Now, in your 70s, how has your relationship to sex changed? Well, I'm very monogamous, and I am, I am very happily married to a woman who is also bisexual identified, and we share queer culture. She's also a political activist and, and all that, so we share all that. And we have a very, very deep, fulfilling relationship, and I'm very, very happy in that respect. I'm very glad to be also with someone who understands so many aspects of my experience through her own experience. She doesn't understand everything. She's not, she hasn't had genital reconstruction. <laughs> she hasn't had to have surgery in order to make herself visible, but she knows a lot about those different dynamics. And I really am grateful for that. Your gender took up so much mental space for so long. Do you even think about like your own transness anymore? As a general rule, no, except that I'm still dealing with it so much on a professional level. Not 
about me, but about transness. I have to draw from my own experience and my contacts and things. So yes, it's very present, but like, I don't wake up every day and go, Oh, I'm a transsexual. (laughs) I don't wake up every day and think, Oh, I went through all these processes. I just am. I just am a human being. And it's really great. Okay, so last question, but you describe everything that we've talked about as a spiritual quest. You know, coming to terms with one gender, you say is like no less meaningful than a spiritual quest. And so you transitioned, you know, almost 35 years ago now. Has that spiritual quest been ongoing for you? Like, how how do you define like... Yes, yes. My spiritual quest continues because life continues because people around me die because people around me are born because people are going through all these beautiful and sometimes horrible experiences that's all part of life and life is a spiritual quest but we don't always recognize every aspect of life as spiritual in our busy busy world although i'm not i'm not affiliated with any religious denomination I feel very, very much connected to the spirit of life. And I think that's an important thing to recognize in every transaction, in every long-term goal, in every policy decision. It sounds like, too, for the first part of your life, that quest was like focused on your own gender, and now it's focused on like your community. Yes. I had to figure out how I fit. All that struggle prior to my transition was all about how do I fit into the world? Because people can't see me. Because people misinterpret me. Because people aren't conscious of my experience. Well, nobody's conscious of anybody else's experience. You can't demand that. But when you're young, I think a lot of times that that is what you want. You want to be seen. You want to have everybody understand everything. And you don't know the difference between something deeply internal and okay and something that isn't acknowledged. I think that's an amazing place to leave it. Thank you for this conversation. And that was Jameson Green. Once again, his book, which I highly recommend, is called Becoming a Visible Man. And then next week, we're back continuing our Elders Project with a man who's been described as the greatest diver in the mother effing world. I mean, AZT was an experimental drug. They didn't know the toxicity. They didn't know potential side effects. We were basically guinea pigs. So that is the four-time gold medal winner, Greg Laganis. We talk about his history-making career, about living with HIV, among many other things. So that comes out next week. And then until then, if you enjoyed this podcast, these interviews, please help us by spreading the word. It doesn't have to be to everyone you know. It can be just one person. Send a text, post on social media, do any of those things. And I promise it's the biggest way you can help us continue making this series. We are brought to you by The Advocate Magazine in partnership with GLAAD. I'm Jeffrey Masters. I will see you next week. Bye.